And so what the heck is sustainability for electronics? And at IPC, we are working to figure that out in a way that again, will make sense for the industry. And then we provide those standards, education, advocacy, et cetera, to help them. So easy button, yes, that's what we aim for. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Altium On Track podcast. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. Today, we're talking with Kelly Scanlon, lead sustainability strategist at IPC. Sustainability is a topic that has been front and center in the news quite often over the past few years, especially relating to supply chain and, of course, the environment. And Kelly leads efforts at IPC to integrate this into uh, standards and other issues affecting the industry. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Zach. It's great to be here. Uh, yes, thank you so much for uh, responding to my request. Um, I saw that you had uh, appeared in iConnect 007, um, and uh, I thought it would be great to talk about this topic because it does come up from time to time in various contexts. So if you could, maybe tell us your background and then um, what it exactly it is you do at IPC as a lead sustainability strategist. Yeah. So let me actually start with the lead sustainability strategist part. It's kind of a fun title. Um, my role at IPC is cross-functional. So we are a trade association and we have um, companies around the world that um, subscribe and become members to IPC because we are a standards development organization. We do education, workforce training, advocacy, we're a source of industry intelligence, a source of events. And so I, as the lead sustainability strategist, get to really work across those various functions at IPC to make sure that we are doing what we can to integrate sustainability topics into those offerings. So I get to work across the board to figure out what we can do to make relevant electronics, uh, sustainability for electronics topics um, more tangible, more provide more resources for the industry. And I am able to do that um, because I care a lot about our industry and a lot about sustainability, but also I happen to have a real academic background in this. Um, I have studied environmental health, occupational or worker health, and sustainability sciences. My doctoral research um, actually looked at life cycle assessment. So it's a tool for evaluating impacts to human health and the environment across the product's life cycle, whatever that may be, including electronics. Um, and I was building into life cycle models data and additional ways to look at actually worker health. So it's very um, what, what I do is I look at big problems. I try to take a comprehensive view of those and find all that, like the interconnectedness of all those different factors within those big problems, and then funnel that or otherwise um, manage that in a way that it becomes more practical and more realistic and more tangible so that we have, uh, you know, a, within our grasp, a solution. So that's kind of how I work and what I do, um, what my background is. And now at IPC, that's what I'm doing too. So it's really building on an infrastructure of standards and education and advocacy, et cetera, to integrate sustainability. So if I could attempt to summarize, it sounds like part of your goal in what you do is to make sustainability easy for companies in the electronics industry, whether that is environmental or in some other aspect of sustainability. Is that a fair description? I think that's right. If we have the, you know, the proverbial easy button, uh, we want to, yeah, we want to press that. We want to build that button and we want to press that button. Um, the thing is that it's not easy. Um, and that's kind of the, the joy of this, although it's the stressor at the same time. Um, we, when we say sustainability, what does that mean? And is it environmental? Well, no, actually it's environmental, it's social, it's corporate governance. So it's, you know, it, it's, you can, it's, and not everything's easily categorizable into those three, those three buckets, but in general, that's what we do. Um, and so sustainability is kind of big 
kind of unwieldy. Um, and the other part of that is, you know what? So is electronics. It's kind of big and unwieldy. It's complicated. And so what the heck is sustainability for electronics? And at IPC, we are working to figure that out in a way that, again, will make sense for the industry. And then we provide those standards, education, advocacy, et cetera, to help them. So easy button, yes, that's what we aim for. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Um, now, I've mentioned environmental a couple of times. You mentioned it. And I think when people hear the word sustainability, first, they probably do cue into the environmental side of it. But then I think for folks in the electronics industry, they default to like Reach and Rojas. And then if they're paying attention to some of the newer issues that have been come up, uh, come up in the past few years, it's on uh, PFAS or PFAS. Um, mm -hmm. So those uh, forever chemicals that persist throughout the environment. Um, and there is legislation and guidelines throughout the industry and um, directives overseas, like in Europe, that are trying to address all of that. So what's the interplay between what IPC does and then what the broader set of environmental regulations try to address? Yeah, um, there's a lot of overlap. And so let me let me take it from this direction and then you re-steer me. Um, so we can say that on our planet Earth, the European Union has really been leaders in thinking through and actually producing policies that have real, um, real opportunities for change in this space of environment, uh, uh, in this space of sustainability. And those are big drivers because it is those policies will affect any company in the EU um, and then also any company within the value chain of those EU companies. And so it has these tentacles that reach out far and wide. So you have those big policy drivers. Those policy drivers, though, in the EU and then elsewhere, it's not unique to the EU, but let's just stay with them for now. Those are not just environmental right? It is social um, and it is corporate governance. So there's a really um, important uh, policy policy that's moving through the, the parliament, the Euro European parliament, European council, European commission right now, corporate sustainability due diligence directive. And that would obligate certain companies um, in due time, probably a whole lot of companies, but there'd be a tiered um, implementation, depending on size, revenue, a few things, a few factors. Point is, is that it's obligating those corporations to look at human rights and environmental due diligence and to be aware of not only what they're doing, but what others in their value chain are doing. And so that, again, has really far reaching um, power to to really affect change. And one thing that we notice is that it's not just kind of a business model change, it's a behavioral change. And so when we think of environmental, social, corporate governance, so corporate governance, some examples maybe might be helpful, like ethics, um, product assurance, security issues. Um, so really those, those um, anti-corruption type issues that really are the almost the bottom line bread and butter of any company. You kind of need to do those things no matter what. But social sustainability, what does that include? Well, that can be diversity and equal opportunity, worker health and safety, labor practices and child labor or forced labor issues. Um, and then you've got your environmental issues, which I do think that many of us are more kind of innately attuned with. Um, and it does, but environmental touches a lot of things. It can be energy, water, waste management, chemicals management, um, and then the, the resulting um, emissions from those. So waste emissions, um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and how you actually account for those things. So it's really quite diverse. And when we start talking about sustainability for electronics, is it all of those things? Is it some of those things? Is it something else that is yet to be named? That's part of what we're working on. So when I hear uh, due diligence, um, especially surrounding corporate governance, that makes me think that um, there's an element of auditing involved. And there is certainly a role for companies to uh, 
maybe demand certain certifications or proof of compliance with certain regulations. Um, I know typically there are things like um, conflict mineral uh, statements. Um, there are other sorts of statements that companies make to try and prove and demonstrate that they are compliant with these goals and issues. Um, what other ways can companies go about ensuring that their supply chain, whether it's, you know, lower level vendors um, or the people who are going to use their products are sustainable? Yeah, that's a great question um, because I don't know the answer. <laughs> How can companies So that's do your this? job to help figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so there's a few things. There's if we have no policymakers anywhere in the world and no regulations anywhere in the world and there's no need to comply because you're going to get in trouble with the regulator. Well, you know, I think we'd still have our own policing that goes on, which is what's happening already, right? We see that stakeholders really, um, really make these, uh, put pressure on companies to do things. And so how do you, um, how do you keep the regulators happy and your stakeholders, meaning your own employees, your community where your facility operates, your shareholders and investors? Um, how do you how do you satisfy all of them? Well, one is, of course, if there are specific requirements like a CE mark for Ross or some sort of other um, required disclosure, you would need to do that. Um, but the other is, again, getting at what is turning into well, soon will be more uh, stated requirements, but in the meantime, are very strong best practices around sustainability reporting. And so companies take on the obligation to be more transparent with all of their stakeholders by producing reports. And these reports can address specific disclosure requirements and also go beyond to really address how they uh, determine what is relevant in the space of sustainability for their company or the products they make. Um, what are the uh, obligations that they promise, for example, targets to achieve net zero or reductions in their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so there's a lot of, um, move, there's a movement to have more just honesty and transparency in what you're doing. And so I, I, that then leads to, I think, a bigger problem, which is, well, if there, are people telling the truth? And what is truth when you don't necessarily have benchmarks to measure it against or to, to hold yourself against to say this is what's real and not real? Um, you have issues. Um, golly, it's just... Oh. It's tough because every, um, every company may do it a little bit differently. If you're a multinational company, you have different regulatory obligations depending on where you operate. So that might look different depending on where you are. How do you do the same thing no matter where you are, whether it's in Asia versus Europe versus Mexico? You know, how do you, how do, you do that? Um, so I feel like I'm meandering a bit here, but I, I, I think the, the point is, is that it's a bit messy. And so going back to the easy button uh, metaphor or, or example, how can we standardize and harmonize what is most relevant in the space of sustainability for the electronics manufacturing value chain? And how then do we provide tools and um, data that allow a more comparable analysis and reporting, whether that is required by law or required by your stakeholders or um, something that you as a business just decide is the right thing to do. Um, again, we're kind of shifting from right thing to do and it makes you feel good to you got to do it. So somewhere on that spectrum, um, there's the, yeah, you're being driven to, to do more. Sure. And I think regarding the easy button, it's much easier to create an easy button with environmental stuff because you set a limit on chemicals, either you're above it or below it, and that determines compliance. And then you specify who's responsible for testing and proving it. And I, I think we've done a pretty good job with like Rojas and Reach. But when you start getting into these elements of social and you start getting into these elements of uh, some of these, you know, stickier, I guess not stickier, but messier issues like maybe child labor or conflict minerals yeah. or, you know, things like that. Um, that seems like 
something that's very difficult to penetrate and test for. Like if I'm a manufacturer and I'm sourcing materials from somewhere overseas, you know, of course I want to make sure that it is sourced sustainably and it doesn't have undue negative social impact. But I mean, how do I go about verifying that? Yeah. I mean, do I have to, how do, do I travel to the supplier's facilities right. and, yeah. you know, make and sure that they're doing everything correctly? Indeed. Some companies are doing that, right? Where they will do supplier checklists, they'll do supplier assessments, and they actually can claim that they're um, doing these assessments. So it it is more likely that they have a real answer as to, you know, who exactly is in their their value chain. Who are those workers? Where are they? But it's true, our value chains are really complicated. So at any point you might be using rare earth elements, well, where are those coming from? And can you even get to those facilities? And so it's not foolproof at all. There's no absolute way. And so you're, <laughs> there's a lot, of, a lot of directions to go here. One would be, um, so if you're the regulator, how do you enforce compliance? And then if you're the company, how do you figure this out? And if you're trying to be competitive and all of you do not want to have child labor or forced labor in your value chain, um, how do you work together maybe? Or how do you figure that out together to make sure that these you don't have an unfair uh, advantage for the one company who might not care and goes forward? I mean, there's just there's a lot there. I think what I want to say, though, is that I would agree with you that the environmental sustainability topics or something, again, more um, just something we've been dealing with longer and have some really um, now decades old laws around. And even if those laws begin to evolve and, and shape themselves to be more conscious of circularity and circular economy, like the Ross Directive is evolving, the REACH regulation is evolving to be conscious of these things and to maybe change to be more inclusive of circularity. Um, but the truth is we've had those with us in our pockets for a while. So even if you throw into the mix a new thing like PFAS, per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, it's, and it, there, wow, that's a whole nother podcast, right? Because that's, <laughs> gosh, there's thousands of them and we are not quite sure where they are all used because they have tremendous functionality, chemical and physical properties that really make them quite useful in a lot of applications. But the, the cases though, that the way we evaluate and think about chemicals is still kind of the same. PFAS are looking to be regulated under the REACH regulation, and it would be a restriction activity. So it's a, a similar mechanism for managing them, even though they're still kind of new to our lingo and new to our um, consciousness. Um, and the other part of that is that indeed, many of the people who are doing sustainability that I've worked with, and I, so I don't know that this is universal, but I've worked with um, outside of electronics and now in electronics industry, came up through the environmental health and safety department. And so that's that's me, right? I'm an environmental health and safety person. I'm an industrial hygienist. I do worker health and safety. Um, I, I, I went the direction of learning more about sustainability and sustainability sciences. Uh, and yet here I am, the lead sustainability strategist. Every now and again, you'll get an engineer mixed in, right? But they too were probably like an environmental engineer or a chemical engineer. And so that's great, but they, they speak that same lingo. And so what we're seeing is this need for increased awareness about the other dimensions of environmental and then all these other sustainability buckets, these other sustainability things, because there is this interconnectedness of them, um, the social and the corporate uh, governance um, uh, pillars of sustainability. And that means that if you're an environmental health person, you might not be best equipped to deal with these other things, these other sustainability pillars. And so who is? And so we're seeing more than ever the need for these multifunctional, multidimensional teams that you do have your human resources person, your legal person, your financial person, you need, or people, you need teams that understand um, how those different issues manifest or how those different topics are, are manifesting or, or being managed within your, your company, within at a specific facility, um, or even benchmarking against others in your supply chain segment. So it's, there's a, 
I think the, the bottom line of this podcast is, wow, it's a lot. And yet we're, again, trying to make sense of all of it because it is possible to make sense of it. But it's big. It's big. Yeah, what I'm what I'm hearing here is that at least on the environmental side, because it's been going on for so long, there are processes in place that make it easy, right? That's the easy button is there's a well-defined process. It's proliferated throughout the industry. There are enough people that have experience doing it that you can hire someone, they can set up a program and they can ensure compliance and then accurately communicate content of any hazardous substances to both customers as well as um any vendors or whatever requirements they need their vendors to, to, to meet. But because of the evolving and maybe not so well-defined issue of social sustainability, um, it's a bit more difficult to define what exactly the process is. Mm -hmm. And I think also um, some of the uh, suppliers who you might be trying to vet for their level of sustainability, um, I think there's another issue of just honesty um, it, it seems to me that, um, essentially you're pushing off the liability onto somebody else by doing mm -hmm. these vendor checklists. And as long as the vendor just puts up the window dressing while you're there in the factory, you can say truthfully, well, we went there and we looked okay. and everything looked on the up and up. And then lo and behold, they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing, um, mm -hmm. especially within the bounds of, of social uh, sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would like to say that my experience, not only with the electronics manufacturers that are affiliated with IPC, whether they're members or not, and then even before that, the other places where I've worked, including Department of Defense, there's actually a whole lot of people, a whole lot of companies um, that are doing the quote, right thing. And we know that the right thing evolves over time. We, we get, you know, new updated ways of thinking of things. Um, so know that, that that's not a, a great statement. The right thing is right for that moment. But indeed, they've been trying to do the right thing and are doing the right thing. But in, in, yet still, we know that there are, there are issues and weeding those out and putting a lens on those is really, is really important. And uh, right now we're really relying on policies to force um, force activities that make you really check those boxes and double check those boxes to make sure that those are, those are the right things, but that the, the, the right things are happening. Um, cause if it wasn't a problem, then we wouldn't be talking about it. So, but on the sure. balance, I think most are doing, are doing what they can and are, are don't want any, you know, non-compliance, um, and want products that work. So. Yeah, yeah, that's understandable. I think at some point, though, you know, as you push push the responsibility for compliance farther up your uh, supply chain, um, at some point you have to rely on where you source from, and you need to source from jurisdictions that have those regulatory policies in place that then require all of your suppliers to also be compliant. Mm -hmm. yep. Because if you're sourcing from somewhere that doesn't have those regulations in place, then at some point you may run into a dishonest supplier because there's nothing they're forcing them to be honest. That's right. Uh, yeah. And that's, again, the, the movement is to do that, to hold more accountable. And so this is, this is uh, also part of the challenge of, so when you think about even just the electronics value chain, if we just loosely say the OEM is the ultimate, ultimate customer, even though we know the user is really the customer, but that you're building electronics for, um, against specifications or requirements, contract um, obligations to what, what is needed at the end of the, the end of the chain. And that um, the, uh, as these policies evolve and as these kind of peer pressure evolves, those OEMs are wanting more clarity and proof that what the suppliers are giving to them is accurate and reliable. And so that's where, again, this is part of our job at IPC. We already do standards. Can we be doing more to standardize the types of information that are necessary to demonstrate that and to then move that information through that complicated supply chain with reliability so that you have more accurate data moving more reliably 
through a supply chain and that we are able to guard the information from those who do not need to see it and provide access to those who do need to see it such that you can fulfill obligations to whether it's contract obligations or just peer obligations to be more transparent. And then also this makes everything so much more efficient. How do we leverage those efficiencies to build electronics better and actually use those data to say, wait, whoa, what are we doing? What, what is the energy input needed here? What are the waste impacts? Um, where does my waste product go? Is recycling an option? What else can I be doing? And so that's, that's I think this is a, just an opportunity. What you're getting at, Zach, is, well, this is hard and this is people are going to lie, cheat and steal possibly. So, well, it's really an opportunity to standardize, harmonize and move, um, get better data that we can move more reliably uh, so that we, we do. We solve, we solve some real problems. Yeah, that gets us closer to that uh, easy button that we already yeah. have with the environmental side. So yeah. one one question I have is, um, in, in terms of the work that you do, are you working closer with manufacturers or do you interface with designers? And the reason I ask that is is because at some point, a designer is the one that creates the product that's going to get manufactured. Yeah. And it's their input that creates the specification that the manufacturer has to follow. So given that that's the case, what do product designers and PCB designers uh, have to do to ensure that they are meeting sustainability goals that I think we all agree are important and the right thing to do? Yeah. So there's like two things you're getting at there. Um, one is what should the, you know, we're just leaping right ahead to designers, fix this. <laughs> designers, call the designers, shout out, wake up, do something. Um, so yes, but before that, I, my job and what IPC does, I will talk to everybody and anybody in the value chain. I want as much information as possible. We need a stronger community of sustainability for electronics. And I am excited to be building that community. And today I'm glad to be talking to you to say we need this community and the listeners to this podcast can be part of that community. Um, it can be more formal, but right now it's rather informal. We just want people talking about this and coming forward with ideas of how to address environmental, social, governance, sustainability issues for the value chain based on what is most pressing and relevant, because not everything's relevant to electronics, but what is most pressing and relevant that we can do that. And indeed, design for blank line is the answer. Design for environment, design for circularity, design for recyclability, design for remanufacturability, design for energy, um, you design, design, design. How can we design for excellence and make it such that we have some sort of continual improvement process that, and this is kind of asking for a lot here, but that we don't design something and then build it that way forevermore, but that we build in some sort of flexibility as to what we design and how we make it, knowing that there are, you know, not only product life cycles, and, but there's a product design life cycle. So it takes time to design it and get it into, you know, the shape where it's actually in my hand to be used or in the hand of the aerospace and defense industry, whatever it may be. But I do see that designers are the key here to really um, making substantial change. And so um, I, I believe that there needs to be, and this is, if I, if I can, I would say, how do we define sustainability for electronics right now? I shy away from defining it because it isn't really definable, but I, I kind of have three tenets of what, what makes something, um, an elect how do you build electronics better, meaning better being sustainably. Um, so conscientious and intentional life cycle management, um, and that's for the processes as well as the products. Um, attention to information, that can increase resource efficiency and decrease impacts and awareness of concepts, approaches and metrics that allow you to um, make better decisions, but not just at any one moment in time, but continuously, so continuous improvement. Okay, so designers are ripe to be doing those things. 
So we need designers to have that awareness of what can increase resource efficiency. Um, so they need more information around a little bit of what are the, the policies that are driving changes. For example, if they think PFAS are the best things since sliced bread and they're designing for using PFAS forevermore, guess what? That's a bad idea. So let's get them the knowledge they need to be like, oh, wait, wait, okay, we're not using those anymore. What can we be using? Should we be out there finding safer alternatives or different alternative chemicals um, or processes for making whatever we need to make? Um, but it's also that, you know, that, that kind of shift in thinking of always trying to do it a little bit more conscientiously and continuously improving. So I think designers are ripe to do that as well. Let's, let's tap into their creativity and that natural inclination to fix problems um, and design your way out of it. Uh, so I, I, yeah, designers. So what can PCB designers do? Well, it's a little bit of the, what everybody can be doing, have more knowledge about um, why you're making something. What is that end goal and what goes into it, right? What are those inputs that go into it? Energy, water, um, recycled content, chemicals, materials, workers, workers go into your product, um, uh, ethics go into your product. So how do you, how do you, how do you get designers in the know about all of that stuff? How do you get anybody in the know about all of that stuff? And then, um, uh, the, the, the need to actually design it with a conscientiousness, right? So design for that recyclability, design for remanufacturability. Not everything is going to be designed the same way. Certain things should be more durable. High performance electronics need to be durable. They need to be able to perform in these high pressure, high heat, high temperature, cold temperature, low temperature environments. Um, but some things don't need to be. So you design for recyclability or um, maybe you've got the middle of the line things that need to be designed for remanufacturability because you actually can kind of keep parts of it, but you can remanufacture to be purpose somewhere else. So I don't, I, I don't know. I can, I just rambling again, Zach. So it's, it's just a, the designers I do, I do see as the key to the, the kingdom here. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, cause like I said, they, they have to specify what gets done and, um, the manufacturer should or does try to, to fit within that spec. Yeah. Um, it sounds to me like cognizance is really important here because if the designer is aware of the things that could have a negative impact, whether it's environmental or social, um, goes against their company values, or they just want to take a personal stance on something, they have the ability to do that to some extent. And I think if enough designers complain to manufacturers about some of these issues, manufacturers will start marketing to their sustainability aspect. Would you, would you agree mm -hmm. to that? Yeah, um, I like that. I like that you said it first. So again, call shout out to designers, complain. <laughs> <laughs> Zach told you, go ahead and take that up the chain. And that's part of, you know, that's what I want to be doing as well. I'm I'm in a role where I can be top down and bottom up, which means what do the executives need and want and what are they seeing? Um, and then also what are the people, the designers and, and others really seeing as possible solutions? Let's empower them to speak up and bring, bring their, their bright ideas together. Um, and so, yeah, have them complain is a strong word, but yeah, let's give them voice. And so one of the things um, we can be doing at IPC is doing, we're really good at holding events, whether it's in person, like the Apex Expo or virtual events, we do all sorts of things. We're good at it. Let's do more of it in the space of sustainability for electronics. Um, we're thinking about, so I'm, I'm saying it out loud, so it's gotta come true now, doing more workshops where we would actually bring together people who are working real case study or real real problems, solving real problems. And we can make those into case studies. And yeah, maybe it doesn't fit your company exactly, but maybe it does enough that you can make that change. So in the space of energy management, as well as energy data and how you go about figuring out scope one, two and scope three, greenhouse gas emissions reporting obligations and how and what you put into that. If others are doing it, can we be bringing together those experts through this community of sustainability for electronics 
to talk through how they work through that solution. Um, and even talk through what didn't work, what worked, what didn't work. And so we can be providing more of those types of workshops and case studies where that bottom up is happening. And at those events, we don't have just designers. We've got maybe some executives in the room, maybe some of these other um, professionals at your company that you rely on to help you get things done, like the legal department, um, like the contracts people. So I can see that being a, a rather elegant solution and really empowering those out there that have really great ideas and actual solutions that we can be touting those and helping others who, who need that help. Well, uh, everyone heard it here first, uh, more of those workshops. So <laughs> now you definitely have to do it. Yeah. Um, so I, I get that that's a great bottom up approach. I would hundred percent agree with you should, should, uh, more of that should be done, but, um, from the top down, one thing I'm noticing is that there are a lot of companies now that have hired chief sustainability officers. Mm -hmm. And just the fact that you're adding that into the C-suite, I think is a, is a big acknowledgement of the importance of this concept of sustainability in all of its different facets. So with companies in the electronics industry, are you or other people at IPC working with those CSOs in any way? And how do their views on sustainability jive with yeah. your views and with IPC's views? Yeah, so their views are our views, right? I may have expertise in sustainability, but that's nice but not, um, and it's good to understand all of that, but what I say is not what goes. What I do is bring in those voices. So just like I want all those designers to complain and speak up, I also want all of those chief sustainability officers to complain and speak up as well, right? I love that we're using this word complain, but it's really, right, talk, say, get out there. And so I, we are harnessing their and not everybody's a, a chief sustainability officer. That title, though, is becoming more um, more prevalent, and it's great to see that, and we'd like to see more of that. But again, it's this role that is a senior level person, maybe in the C-suite, who is accountable for sustainability for that facility, that company. Um, it, you know, there's, there's people like me at associations that are responsible for kind of like entire industry segments, which is really exciting. Um, so yes, we want them to bring us what is going on. And we've been doing this kind of stakeholder engagement to engage with them to say, what is happening? What is your, what is pressing on you right now? What, uh, where are there gaps that we can try to address that? And even if IPC cannot address it through our standards, education, advocacy, et cetera, who else can so that we can be empowering and partnering with, for example, other associations to be doing more of this, whether it's in the electronic space or not. We see that there's powers, power in partnerships. So we are engaging with these chief sustainability officers or other senior directors that are responsible for sustainability at their companies. We have a sustainability for electronics leadership council where we have about 11 of those such people from um, a diverse geographic background and diverse supply chain background that come together. We've been meeting every two weeks. So we are, it's serious. And we're talking through both like a little moment to say what's on your minds and what's bugging you and what 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 is pressing on you but then also trying to turn that into real action and real real solutions like okay we're going to need an action team to talk about greenhouse gases we're going to need an action team to talk about supply chain communications we have an action team on events planning so yeah uh, so whatever whatever's on their mind we want to we want to harness um, through the leadership council through more of our publications, through more events, again, building this community so that we can be more targeted and smart about where, what we focus on, how we focus on it, and what we don't focus on, because you can't do it all, but you can try to find the most uh, relevant and material topics. And if you do that, that will get you a long way to, to making some real change. So there are obviously a lot of levers that IPC can pull to try and push, you know, push the needle. Um, you mentioned education and training. I think most designers are familiar with standards, um, advocacy events, and then 
some of what IPC does, it feeds into legislation. I know that IPC isn't writing legislation, but some of that does end up feeding into legislation. So what levers need to be pulled for different groups? Is the education and training the best tool to ensure that designers are implementing yeah. sustainability practices, whereas you know standards and, and legislation are going to affect up at the top where the OEMs and maybe the tier one suppliers live? Yeah. So Zach, um, let's come back to that question on a follow-up podcast in the near future, because IPC is trying to figure that out right now. So in addition to the leadership council, um, which gives us kind of that industry insight and expertise, we're also looking to pull together industry data and information through an industry-wide materiality assessment. That materiality assessment will provide us with kind of that context of what is sustainability for electronics, what's in and what's out. Then funneling down, what can IPC do to address those things? And so let's say we, we get down to 10 topics, 10, 10 is easy. Well, maybe only one of them is, is elegantly served through an event. We always do events on a certain topic, but standards really address these three over here. And advocacy is really good for not only those three, but these two over here. So we are trying to figure out the funnel, right? What ha we are, we have a process for funneling, and then we need to digest, find those results and digest them. Figure out which IP, IPC levers are, as you say, are actually um, most suitable to addressing them uh, and go from there. So we don't know yet what is what. We're working on it right now, and I, I want to make that promise to you and the industry that we do want to make sense of that because it is just too much to digest. So if we can make it, uh, we've gone through the process of, of digesting it. We can provide you with some assurance as to where you can focus your resources, and we can provide you with some tools that will help you uh, on your sustainability journey. And then also... Um, again, if there's somebody else out there that can be helping, that we're empowering that partnership to to do more together to help to help the industry. If we can't do it all, who's who else is on the team that can help? So that is a process we're going through right now, and we plan to have better answers in the next few months. So by the end of this calendar year. That's all great to hear. And yes, we'd love to have you back on to, to talk about this more as some of these ideas and concepts get fleshed out and IPC really figures out the best path forward for everybody. Um, one last question, um, because this is such a new thing and because IPC does work so closely with designers and manufacturers to get their input, how can designers and manufacturers get involved? How can they make sure that their voices are heard and that their good ideas are taken seriously? Yeah. So um, the again, we started with the easy button. We end with an easy button, which is it's as simple as contacting me. Um, I'm your your portal to getting involved with this expanding community for uh, you know sustainability for electronics, uh, and that we are going to have not just this leadership council uh, that is maybe more of the executive level or senior level. Uh, we're going to have more action teams and more events. So we need subject matter experts who can be presenting. We need subject matter experts who can help to solve some of these problems, volunteering for our advocacy government relation committees, um, volunteering for these standards development committees to create harmonized standards for whatever it may be, greenhouse gases, other energy issues, water issues. Um, so it's as easy as contacting me. Okay, great. Well, then um, I guess people will just have to find you on LinkedIn. Yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn and um, IPC has our sustainability for electronics showcase page. And so that's okay. another great resource because that's I'm behind the scenes there. But um, that's a great resource where we've been pumping out um, things that we're doing things that others are doing on a weekly basis more more than once a week even. So there's this community is growing in that LinkedIn place is a great great way to do it. But yeah, Kelly Scanlon at IPC.org. I'm here. Okay, great. Um, we will include a link to that page in the show notes. So anybody that's interested in getting involved and learning more can check out that link and consume all that knowledge to your heart's desire. Um, Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been really interesting. Zach, thank you. I look forward to our next conversation. 
Yes, definitely. Uh, to everyone that's out there listening, we've been talking with Kelly Scanlon, Lead Sustainability Strategist at IPC. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. Of course, leave your comments and questions, and you'll be able to keep up with all of our episodes and tutorials as they come out. And last but not least, don't stop learning, stay on track, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.